the moderator for this panel moving forward is Shloka Na. Uh, Shloka is the acting director with the India Climate Collaborative. And so I'm gonna let the four of you have your discussion on climate philanthropy and we'll see you back at the end of your, your session. Uh, over to you, Shloka. Thanks so much, MR. Um, I can see already this is another success, um, much like last year, of course. Um, so hi, everyone. You know, welcome to the second session of India Spora's Climate Summit, India Tomorrow, Perspectives from Climate Philanthropy. Thank you to all of the wonderful speakers before this panel for setting such an engaging tone for this evening. And of course, thank you to all of you, our audience members, for being here with us today. For those of you that may not know the India Climate Collaborative or the ICC, as we like to call ourselves, it's actually a first of its kind, India-led, India-focused collective of business and philanthropy that works to accelerate climate action in the country. And we really aim to represent a diversity of voices in the climate ecosystem. We work across sectors to implement scalable solutions, and we strive to increase funding to climate solutions in India. So philanthropic capital, as we all know, is limited. Philanthropic spending on climate, especially in a country like India, which prioritizes developmental needs like healthcare and education is very, very small. The climate crisis on the other hand is massive. It's operating at a scale that was difficult to comprehend before the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet philanthropy is one of our key weapons in the fight against a warming world. And we have spent over a year since the official launch of the ICC in building collaboration amongst India's philanthropic sector We've really worked to increase philanthropic engagement with the need for climate action. And our focus has been on growing India's domestic philanthropies to become champions for the climate cause. Yet the ICC itself would be incomplete without the unwavering support of international philanthropies across the world. Many of their India programs chaired by diaspora, just like yourself, committed to furthering the development of their country, even from miles away. So it's a pleasure for me to be able to introduce you to our wonderful panel for this evening, all of whom have been close advisors and supporters of the ICC and have been instrumental in helping build India's climate movement through funding, through capacity building, and of course, through their tremendous vision and grip. I know with them already, so I'm not gonna do an extensive introduction, but just to sort of recap, Hisham Mandol is the chief advisor to the newly formed India branch of the Environmental Defense Fund, one of the world's leading environmental organizations that uses science, advocacy, economics, and partnerships to bring about impactful solutions and lasting change. Jane Burston is the executive director and founder of the Clean Air Fund, a global philanthropic initiative to tackle air pollution with a special focus on in the Indian region. Anita Nakpal Schwartz heads the, heads the Nature Conservancy's philanthropic efforts for India and the US and the UK. TNC, of course, is a global nonprofit dedicated to conserving the planet's natural resources. Our last panelist, Siddharthan Balasubramaniam, Senior Advisor of Strategy at Climate Works Foundation, unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight due to a personal emergency, but Sid has been an incredible source of support for the Indian climate movement, and we will miss him tonight. So with that, I'm going to pass our mic on to our panelists for the evening. And Anita, I'm actually gonna open up with you. My first question for you is, why is philanthropic capital so well suited to tackling the climate crisis? And why is it especially relevant for India? Well, Shloka, thank you. Do I have about five minutes on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. It's so nice to see you on camera today. Uh, as, as you know, our organizations have uh, worked together, but you and I have not personally connected. So it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for asking a great question. And yes, philanthropic capital is essential to carrying out climate goals in India, to meeting our climate goals in India. Organizations like the Nature Conservancy have set uh, carbon reduction goals. In our case, we have a goal of reducing carbon by three gigatons per year through sequestration and reduced emissions emissions rather, not admissions, emissions. Over 10 years, that's equivalent to removing 650 million cars from the road. So it's going to require, it's important and it's going to require uh, philanthropic support. And it is actually essential that we succeed. As we know, a climate crisis is a people crisis too. We're looking at fundamental issues of survival, clean air, access to water, and food demands. 
Um, we know that, that food demands are gonna increase in India by 50% by 2030. Um, energy demands expected to go up by 175% and water demands expected to go up by 50%. These are all related to climate. So let's look at how philanthropy is making a difference. Um, just last week, we got a, a large grant. We were so thankful. Um, it's a corporate grant that's gonna allow us to work for on a water project, Water for Nature and People near Pune, India. We're now gonna launch a project for the Gold River restoration. And there are about 4.5 million people who rely on that river as their main water source. So a grant that can impact 4.5 million people is a huge return on investment at any size. Um, on food security, with ph philanthropic investments from Tata Trust Shloka, where I know you've had a good experience, we're looking at fundamentally addressing agricultural practices in Punjab and Haryana and making those practices far more sustainable. I know Jane knows quite a bit about this as well, but we're working to phase out the crop residue burning there uh, that's taking place and sending you know, impacting the farmer's health there, but also sending really bad air to Delhi in the winter time. And uh, we're working there with 250,000 farmers. And with the sustainable practices that we're putting in place, their incomes can also go up. So huge return on investment. Choosing renewable energy, great way to impact India's air quality and reduce climate emissions. We've worked on a tool, a tool called SiteRight. And our work on that has been supported through private philanthropy, foundation funding. And this tool helps planners figure out where they can put in place large wind and solar projects without disrupting forests or tribal communities. This allows business to go ahead. Clean, green business in India creates jobs, helps address the climate crisis. And my last example, and probably our best one, with philanthropic funding, we provided a set of recommendations to the Indian government at their request. They were looking for information on how to allocate tax dollars to support climate goals. So now substantial funds are going to be sent to states that, uh, that have extensive green cover. And the amount sent is gonna be based on their green cover. This motivates states to keep their forests and to create new ones and it helps India meet its climate commitments. To give you an example of return on investment, we got this win when we were a $6 million program overall, the Nature Conservancy in India, $6 million program. The amount of return on investment is $66 billion. That's billion US dollars going to states with green cover. Um, this is the world's largest fiscal transfer based on green cover and is an enormous win. And it will shape the way India proceeds going forward. A great way to help meet climate goals. All of this work happens through private philanthropy. And so I think, you know, organizations like the Nature Conservancy, there are many others out there doing great work, can make a case that the, phil the philanthropy helps at every level. Thank you so much for letting me share that. And thank you to all the partners out there in India who make our work possible. We don't do this work alone. Thank you, Anita. It's lovely to finally connect with you as well. Um, thank you for bringing home such a crucial point. It's often not about the amount of funding, but the strategic imperative behind that funding, because what philanthropic capital can be and what no other form of capital, of capital can be is actually incredibly catalytic. So thank you for that. I think your examples were fantastic. Um, and I think they really brought home that point. Um, moving to Hisham now. Um, Hisham, it's great to see you here again. Um, how can philanthropy support India's transition to a net zero economy? And how can philanthropy play a really key role in the non-mitigation element of the, of the climate crisis? And so when I say non-mitigation, I mean adaptation, just transitions, things that are really not accounted for in this race to net zero. Sure, thank you. Um, lovely to see you as well. And, and thank you in diaspora, both the team as well as the members of the diaspora for, for, for caring about the issue and, and, and uh, the country. Um, so, 
you know, Satya, at the start of today's session, spoke about uh, Nexio and his perspective. And I wanted to share a slightly nuanced view on this as well. Um, there is a lot of talk around net zero, uh, and there's a difference between achieving net zero, getting close to net zero, and making co public commitments about net zero. And, and I, I think it's important to just kind of figure out what is the value or otherwise of a net zero commitment. A net zero commitment is fantastic as a battle cry. It's fantastic as a set of organizing principles that guides policy, resourcing, etc. Um, but it is far more critical to think about the building blocks that would go into a net zero achievement and the milestones around it rather than say net zero by X, Y, Z, and then we'll see you in 2040 or 2050. What are these kind of building blocks? Um, you know, it could be of, of, of a wide range of things. We could be thinking about how do we fundamentally reduce the cost of transition for an industrial plant? Um, how do we get climate smart agriculture, the climate smart bit of agriculture to start kicking in? How do we bring in new science like green hydrogen, for example? How do we catalyze market forces of the kind that uh, Anita spoke about uh, a moment ago? Milestones, let's take the electric vehicle example and if you look at it, we've made this uh, national pledge that all cars in India are gonna be, uh, you know, only electric cars sold by X state. Along the way, though, we need to be thinking about the share of electric vehicles to total sales. We need to be thinking about the number of states with electric vehicle incentives. We need to think about the, number, the, 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 the volume of charging infrastructure. Those are the kind of things that are far more likely to get you to actual net zero than the commitment per se. I'm not dissing the commitment. I'm saying think about the, the building blocks and, and the organizing principles. What would the role of philanthropy be? So personally, I believe that philanthropic money is precious and needs to go to those areas. It needs to be used as funding what is unfundable, the tougher areas out there. What are these tougher areas? These are the ones which tend to be politically challenging or technically complicated or a mix of both. In that context, therefore, think about where in the broad spectrum of net zero emissions are really the hardest issues. There are hard to abate industries like cement and steel. Very little progress is being uh, made on them. There are really hard questions that we are still not addressing. 500,000 jobs come from coal in India. Coal is not going to go away unless we think about what happens to 500,000 people in three states with 41 looks of uh, 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 MPs uh, and, you know, presumably multiplied by five number of family members. That's a real constituency that we have to think about. Um, there are tough scientific questions which uh, uh, need philanthropic money. We, you know, in the breakout group that we have, we were talking about how artificial intelligence and machine learning need to come into play uh, uh, to resolve uh, uh, or make progress on, on climate smart agriculture. There's also the opportunity for uh, philanthropy to support what I call leapfrog technologies. As a country, we jump from no phones right over landlines into mobile, no bank branches, no banking. We went straight to mobile banking. Those are the kinds of technologies which will require the risk capital and the patient capital that only philanthropy can, uh, uh, can bring in. Um, just on the mitigation and adaptation point, uh, it's... India is interesting because we're, we're so early on in our growth journey that adaptation and mitigation kind of tend to become intertwined. Half the buildings that we need are not yet built. If we have to meet uh, our economic growth objectives, we're going to have to double uh, steel and, and, and cement manufacture. So I, I wouldn't be so fussed about uh, are we you know, slotting it in adaptation or, uh, or mitigation, but the point I'd make is come back to saying where can philanthropic money either be catalytic or leveraged. Catalytic in terms of creating new markets like, for example, the LED bulb phenomenon that, that has exploded in India or uh, leveraging government spending. There's a lot of well-intentioned government spending that needs a little bit of, of, of uh, support and guidance that can deliver disproportionately good results. I'll pause here. Thanks, Hisham. I thought that was actually really well said, as always. And I love how you um, 
Uh, you spoke about how you know philanthropy could support that transition, but you really broke down incred an incredibly complex issue um, into the building blocks of any big target, right? And those organizing principles, setting those shorter term milestones. Um, and I got that you aren't dissing the commitment. Thank you for clarifying that as well. Um, I think we do need to find a commitment though that walks the tightrope between supporting innovation and growth and actually being achievable. And I think your examples were really well sort of taken in that. And I'm sure we'll come back to this, um, but I'm gonna move on to Jane now um, because she also has an incredibly sort of um, interesting area of work and, um, to what we're dealing with in India right now. If you can talk to us a little bit, Jane, about you know, your experience at the Clean Air Fund and in your opinion, how can learning from the air pollution sector really inform efforts to expedite funding um, to an engagement with other sectors within climate action in India? Thanks, Luca. Um, great to be part of this panel and um, great question. I mean, I actually don't see action on air pollution and action on climate as two different things. I think that they're um, done well can be exactly the same thing. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons why many funders that we see are coming to uh, air pollution or from air pollution are coming to climate is the opportunity for wins on both health and uh, reduction of greenhouse gases. I think um, what we've seen is that uh, for some segments of the population, they really, well, lots of segments of the population really care about climate change, but it doesn't affect their decision making on a day to day basis, even though they do genuinely have this concern, they, they don't tend to translate it into their everyday lives. Whereas with air pollution, because it's, it impacts them and their families every day, uh, it's something that seems a lot less remote, a lot more urgent, local and tangible often than the impacts of climate change. So there, there's huge different segments of the population who would understand broadly and be motivated to um, do something about air pollution that might not if we were talking solely in climate change terms. Um, one of the interesting things that we saw at the beginning of the COVID pandemic is uh, we funded a, a survey across many different countries globally about how much do people care about air pollution and where does it rank in their list of environmental concerns, where does it list in their um, rank in their list of health concerns. And we were absolutely blown away that in India, um, I mean, obviously 94% of people think that air pollution could be improved in their local area. But what blew us away was that 86% of people said that they were concerned about air pollution as a health concern. And it was exactly the same percentage were concerned about infectious disease. And this was, you know, in the, after the first couple of months of the pandemic, in a lot of other countries, we saw infectious disease coming a high first and air pollution uh, a second. But uh, the fact that they're, they're on a par in India um, does speak volumes. I think it, the, the fact that there are wins available here on health is really heightened by what we've learned about the links between air quality and the respiratory diseases that air, air pollution causes and COVID itself. Um, you know, people are even more aware than they were before of um, people with that are vulnerable because of respiratory diseases that have either been caused by air pollution or are being exacerbated by air pollution. And uh, so there's even more sensitivity to the topic and not least because we've also at the same time in many areas with lockdown seen air pollution come right down. So people can see that it is a problem that can be tackled. I think one of the things um, that I find in incredibly motivating for working on this is the benefit to children's health for every single microgram that we can reduce, it does have a tangible impact on children's health and children's prospects and prosperity later in life. Um, I'll, I'll come on to the kind of economic benefits to business in a minute, but I, I was struck recently reading a study that some Israeli economists has, have done where they looked at just the short term impact of air pollution on children on the day that they were taking their exams. 
and uh, you know, correcting for all other confounding factors, they found that children who were in schools that couldn't afford air purifiers on high air pollution days scored much worse in their exams than either children in schools that had air purifiers or children that took their exams on lower pollution days. And they calculated the impact that that would have on their future earnings. And it was really significant, something like $30 a month for the rest of their lives uh, lost because of their, their lower high school exam score. And that's just exposure on one single day, the kind of loss of concentration that you get when you're when you're being poisoned by the air. So there's a huge equity issue here for the kids that are going to schools that can't afford the purifiers. Um, and, you know, whose, whose mothers have been exposed uh, whilst pregnant. Um, and, and then finally, I think one of the things that we're learning is that uh, even though the health impacts are massive and even though the co-benefits to climate change of tackling air pollution are incredibly significant, often pollution-related legislation or action kind of stops when it comes to tackling the Treasury or the Finance Ministry um, uh, and in terms of getting businesses involved. Sometimes it's hard to push the, the private sector to voluntary action. So one of the things that we've really focused on funding is evidence of the economic benefit of tackling um, air pollution. And this report from Dalberg out this morning is an absolutely phenomenal example of that. I think uh, India is leading in the world in this kind of analysis. 3% um, of GDP is a huge number. And I think as, as the government thinks about building back better, it will be very interesting evidence to take into account for um, how tackling air pollution can really support businesses. Because I think often the narrative is development, economic development, uh, an inevitable consequence of that is the pollution that we see. And actually for many industries, the exact opposite is true when we're looking at staff productivity um, and, uh, and the impact on particular sectors like tourism. So I think in conclusion, I th uh, the, the, the win, win, wins for, for health and climate and the economy is one of the main things that we've learned. And uh, you know, building on the points of the other two speakers, the opportunity for collaboration, not just across the, the NGO sector, but also with the health sector and uh, with the private sector too is huge. Thanks, Jane. I think the report you've launched today is, is, going, is a seminal piece of work and is going to be an important one that's gonna be referred to for a very, very long time to, to come. Um, I think it just goes to the heart of the issue, which you've pointed out, of course, is the structural inequality behind um, climate change. And so if there was ever a sort of modern sort of move in terms of, you know, building out solutions and interventions, it's just that it's going to, speak to the heart of everything that we care about within the development sector as a whole, um, if we don't start dealing with climate change. Um, thank you for that and congratulations on the report. Um, I'm very excited to, to sort of see what comes from it. Um, my next question actually is for all three of you and I'm gonna come back to you, Anita. I think it's, it's a question that's common for all of you but I'd love to hear from, from you first, Anita, what is what is um, TNC's plans and strategies to accelerate climate action in India in the near future? And I think if you could also elaborate a bit on what advice you might give new funders looking to invest in climate action in India. And Jane and Hisham, I'm gonna to come to you next. Um, same question for you. What are your organization's plans and strategies to focus on climate action in India in the near future? And what would be your advice to new funders? So we'll start with you, Anita. Thank you, Shloka. It's a great question. Um, and you know, I've already touched some on our work, the Nature Conservancy's work on energy and policy, work that benefits people, um, work on water. And I wanna say that some of our new projects benefit our furry friends. Um, as India's climate changes, India's wildlife struggles. And so to help, we've got, you know, there are a number of people working on tigers and elephants and, We've got our eye on the gorgeous Himalayan brown bear. There are about five of the, 500 of these bears left. Um, and you know, when their habitat changes, their behavior changes. And so they're coming closer to communities in Ladakh. And what we're looking to do is to collaborate with communities there to prevent some of the human and wildlife conflicts. 
Uh, we're training bear guardians, which to me sounds like a great job title, depending on the day. Uh, and with these bear guardians, they'll look for ways, proactively look for ways for peaceful coexistence, whether that's fencing in corrals or barns, um, to keep the bears away from the livestock or looking at waste management measures so that the waste does not attract the bears. There's a lot that we can do. And these paid guardians can have improved livelihoods. We'll be addressing the first immediate problem, which is this human bear conflict, while we then turn our attention to larger landscape restoration plans that address climate change. And to funders looking to invest in India, I say, please do. I think that the Nature Conservancy and others can make the case that we're getting the return in India, that India is excited to do this work. And within that setting, we're able to do a lot um, like that large uh, ecological fiscal transfer that I referred to earlier of $66 billion. Um, India is mission critical for the Nature Conservancy and for, for other NGOs. Uh, it's third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions and, and holds 8% of the world's biodiversity in a single country. Uh, we must succeed overall for planetary health. And somebody said earlier today that we have half of our hearts in India. That is certainly true, um, very true. And when we look at the job that India has done protecting its biodiversity, they've done very well. This is an incredible legacy to protect. So if you're looking at issues of legacy in India, you gotta fund the nature. Um, and then Shloka, I wanna echo one of the thoughts that you, that you said, which is that you know, conservation and environment really need to be elevated as a philanthropic priority, similar to health and education. In some ways, environment is a health cause. In many ways, it's a health cause. These are issues of human lives, clean water, clean air, um, food security. We can't survive otherwise. Uh, so really these issues do need to come up uh, for funders in a much larger way. And so thank you for that. I hope people will consider it. Thanks, Anisha. Hisham, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it down to you, but thank you, Anita, that was very eloquently said. Sure, sure, thanks. I, thank I want the bear job, by the way, just, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> You're in queue for that one, it's a very good sounding job. Um, and thanks, Anita, and thanks, Shukla. Uh, so EDF has been uh, active in India for uh, close to 10 years. Uh, we've uh, not exactly maintained a high profile, but uh, so that you might not have heard too much about this, but we support Mahindra and Mahindra's uh, net zero commitment, for example. In the days when we used to travel on Indigo Airlines, you had an option of buying a carbon offset that was informed by us. We do work on climate smart agriculture in Bihar and it's extending to Maharashtra where we're trying, uh, we'll be using a uh, you know, combination of digital platforms and micro entrepreneurial models to help farmers uh, A, increase output, but also increase incomes uh, and then have more climate sustainable uh, agriculture practices. We're helping build out in India, air quality center of excellence uh, because one, big lever of change in India is going to be made in India solutions for uh, in Indian problems. Um, our vision uh, is uh, we, we, we see an India with a pathway to a shared, healthy, low carbon prosperity. And our ambition is to be a progressive partner to the country uh, that combines fit for purpose technology, understands the market forces, uh, really embeds in the political economy of, of, of the country and works across a broad sector of uh, stakeholders, businesses, corporates, communities, you know, everyone that matters is, is, is who we work with. Uh, we're setting up an India uh, entity and uh, we're attempting to make it, uh, have it as a made in India uh, entity, solutions for Indians by Indians. And I'll be honest and say we're looking for uh, uh, supporters from uh, uh, the, the diaspora, so uh, we would be happy to carry on this conversation. On advice to fund us, this isn't so much about EDF, but in general, I have two things in my mind. One is just stay focused. Focus on any one or a limited set of areas that you're passionate about and because of the potential it holds. The second uh, is think of those ideas that can scale up 
India can only move forward if we have ideas that have a runway to, to, to scale. Otherwise, we're just playing on the sidelines. Uh, in terms of supporting partners, look for partners that you are comfortable with at an individual level, but who also understand both the science and the politics of working in India and getting change done. And, and those are equally important. Thank you. Thanks, Hisham. I love that a really resounding set of um, ideas and a great call to action. And I think under your leadership, like EDF in India is going to do amazing things. And we're all here to support everyone on this panel. So you have a good team behind you as well. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what that map behind you is off or from. I think it's been a year, but I haven't been able to place it yet. Um, Jane. So you can you can let us know at some point. Jane, over to you. You have the final word. Um, I wanted to hear from you about some of the plans that CAF has in store, um, you know, in the near future. And of course, you know, advice for new funders who are looking to invest in this space. Absolutely. Um, so as a philanthropic organization dedicated to clean air, we are granting to a number of different organizations in India. We don't do the delivery on the ground ourselves. We, we make grants and uh, we make a, a huge variety of grants across a lot of different types of uh, topic on supporting organizations to measure um, air pollution. So the data and making sure that the, the campaigning groups or um, local authorities have access to the data that they need to do their work. Um, looking at the health impacts, working with business and supporting um, pollution control boards, uh, city governments and uh, the national government to really measure what they're, um, what they're looking to measure and, and develop policies on it. And our focus is in cities like New Delhi, Lucknow, Agra, um, really working at, at all tiers of, of government with the city, the state pollution control board and the national government. And I think, um, I mean, one of the things that we have done, which uh, it, I, I found quite striking is looking at the amount of philanthropic funding that's being spent on air pollution globally. Um, for the last couple of years, we've done a report uh, called State of Global Air Quality Funding, uh, which does what it says on the tin. And there's a really very small amount of funding going to uh, reducing air pollution in India. Um, last year, it was, uh, well, for 2019, which we reported last year, it was 13.8 million. And we know that the, the study doesn't necessarily capture all of the funding and it obviously doesn't capture voluntary work because that isn't paid for, but um, that's tiny in comparison to the scale of the challenge. Um, so I would say if you're thinking about investing on um, air quality, literally every dollar does make a difference. Uh, there's loads of really good organizations in India that are struggling for funding and uh, on a range of topics, data if you're a technical person, health impacts if you, know, if you want to work on research and the health side of things, um, local groups and community action. So whatever your interest, there is a group that wants to work on air quality within that. Um, but the advice that I would give, I think two things. One, um, Hisham already said this in his earlier comments, but look for leverage. Uh, one of the reasons that we've funded the Confederation of in Indian Industry to set up this um, private sector CEO forum on air pollution is because there is a huge amount of potential, both in the CSR donation from bus Indian businesses um, the two percent CSR donation, but also the action, the action that they could voluntarily take that would cost a huge amount were we to invest in it, and we we would never have the funding to do that. But by bringing the CEOs together through the Confederation of Indian Industry, it really helps them kind of champion the cause, uh, boost one another's incentive to do something through healthy competition and share best practice for their own industry. So leverage um, for me is pretty key. I think the second um, piece of advice is in, there's a lot of ambition in India. The government has a very strong national clean air plan with very ambitious targets. There's lots of groups that really want change to happen. And so 
you know, invest it, you, it there's, there's a huge opportunity to invest in those organizations that are putting their shoulder behind those targets and really attempting to achieve them rather than, uh, you know, the kind of challenge anti anti everything um, stuff that I think is, uh, is sometimes um, appears to fund. So I would say, yeah, leverage and, uh, and shoulder behind the targets. Thanks, Jane. I think you really nicely tied in um, to some of what, we're, what Hisham and Anita were, were referring to earlier as well, um, that we need a lot more ground level action. I think your point on AQ is, is well taken. There's a lot that we can do, which we haven't managed to do yet. Um, a good example is, of course, you know, the Environmental Pollution Prevention and Control Authority in India has been dissolved, the EPCA. The Commission for Air Quality Management has also lapsed. So we don't really have a governing body for air quality in the country. Um, and, you know, we're looking at targets like net zero and yet there are, you know, of course, these sort of mechanisms at the central level that need to be built in and at the state level um, that don't really exist. And so again, the work that you're doing is absolutely fantastic, but um, we do need to sort of work on really reforming a number of these sectors and, and making so sure we ignite those crucial sectoral transitions and fill in those ecosystem gaps. Um, so the work that all of you are doing is, is so crucial um, to putting India on that path um, to sustainable development. And I really thank you for that. Um, I just wanna wrap up here. I think that's all the time we'll have for tonight. Um, so thank you to the organizers of India's Forum for inviting us, um, for creating this platform to explore India's climate story. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for this evening. And as I said, for the work that you're all doing in this space and for sharing your insights with us tonight. Um, and thank you, of course, to our audience for taking the time out to be with us here today. I think I'll just wrap up on this one note, which is climate change is not an isolated phenomenon. It impacts every single aspect of India's development from healthcare to gender equity to urban planning. We need to bring a climate lens into all the work that we do, into all the funding we give or receive, um, and into our very perception of what the future holds for us. And building resilience is pivotal to, to securing the needs and rights of future generations. And that responsibility really just lies with us. It's in our hands. So we can use climate action to support India's development, to grow India's nascent green economy, to protect India's most vulnerable populations, and it's going to take all of us all, you know, whether you're in the country or outside of it, to come together and invest in the future of this nation. So thank you once again. I hope you've had um, a lovely day or night, as may be the case, um, and do take care of yourselves. Thank you so much and over to you, MR. <laughs>